All right, chat. We're here. I know it's been a while. I've been busy. That's not really a good excuse. I do have a few things I want to discuss around uh, looking glass and a few other things. But uh, there's there's some exciting things happening. Forgot to mute my framework laptop. And I'm having some root beer because, you know, it's going to be a fun, fun sort of chat. And I'm interacting with the chat. Hopefully. I don't spill my root beer everywhere. That would suck, right? Is my audio okay? <clears throat> so I'd kind of like to get into a groove where I do more Linux content, but the editors are kind of overwhelmed with um, a lot of the other videos. And so I'd like to do something that's low effort in terms of I can just set up somewhere and set up some equipment and go live. And so I've kind of got this thing going, like this is in the usual green screen space, you can kind of tell. But we could do show and tell and we can talk about them, some things. This is my overhead view. Hopefully you can still hear me even though it's my, my overhead view. So that shows you, you know, pointing up. And I've got the MS-01 from Minis Forum that we can talk about and we use the overhead footage for. And we can also talk about the Flex 170 because we had some really, uh, interesting feedback on the Flex 170, but the Flex 170 video that I did, it turns out that SRIOV stuff works fine with the iGPU in the uh, 12th, 12th, 13th, 13th generation CPU that's in this thing when you're, especially when you're using out of tree stuff. You also got options for the out of tree SRIOV stuff on uh, Flex 170, so. I mean, there's just, there's so much, there's so much stuff. But Looking Glass for VFIO, like, I don't know where to begin because, okay, so to catch you up to now, believe it or not, even though I've got all those 7,000 series Threadripper machines, I'm still rocking as my daily driver, the 5,000 series Threadripper that has water cooling with the wood paneling and, um, because it's stable and the last, you know, probably since December, I've been working on updating everything with, with VFIO. I've been in touch with Alex Williamson. Of the brilliant, the, the Alex Williamson and looking at the defaults around things like, okay, what about the PCIe ROM bar space? And like, is there communication? And like Jeff, who works on looking glass, talking to some of the AMD team from what I understand about some of the defaults there with, with that. And so like, this is all just, it's, it's wild because there's a lot of stuff where like the left hand doesn't exactly perfectly know what the right hand is doing. And like we don't know due to lack of documentation and some other stuff, some of the stuff about like how the ROM bar space is actually supposed to work. So there's a, there's a guide on the forum. And uh, one of the things was like, Hey, if you change the one ROM bar space, you need to change the other one. Otherwise the drivers crash in a weird way. And it turns out that that was just an oops. Like we, it's not supposed to be like that. It just happens to work. So that's sort of fun. But if you're out of the loop on, uh, Looking Glass, the Looking Glass 7 RC1, and you use VFIO, everybody should give Jeff a bunch of money because he has pulled the most amazing rabbit out of a hat. If it was a magic trick, somehow he has pulled a 300 pound rabbit out of, you know, a standard 10 gallon top hat. And um, the breakthrough is that it is basically direct PCIe, PCIe copy. Um, and you can read about that. There's a link in the description. You should check that out. And uh, it's not quite stable yet. It's still in release candidate status, but it would be good to, um, you know, take that for a spin and kick the tires and that sort of thing, uh, to see how it works. And like, and I was just I was sort of indirectly apologizing for, well, I've got my system stable and I don't want to touch it, which is basically the K and so I've, but I've got a whole 7,000 series Threadripper machine, like the entire, like, did you see the Falcon Northwest system that I got? Well, that wasn't good enough. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to upgrade to WRX 90. And then things went a little sideways with that. And right now the only WRX 90 board you can get is the one from Asus. And the first one that I got was a dud. I've since got a replacement board and that's working great. And so now I'm trying to get 200 and, or to get uh, one terabyte of memory that is stable at DDR5 6000. And that has been a bit of a challenge. Um, so 
yeah, fun times. Um, but uh, Looking Glass, yeah, I'm very impressed with Looking Glass and the PCIe PCIe copy mean you can do things like 4K at 120 FPS. Like that is now not an unreasonable demand of Looking Glass. My goodness, it's been, I have, this is the first root beer that I've had in like three years. I am going to be wired over the moon. So any questions about looking glass or, or anything with that? How many, uh, how many folks in the chat are rocking, uh, looking glass? <laughs> any updates on flex SRIOV? Yes. Uh, the a 770 we'll talk about that in a minute. Can you test Intel's NPU and our core core ultra for C for Linux? So I was supposed to get a core ultra meteor lake for exactly that test, but it fell through and I'm, I've exhausted my laptop budget for the year on like three different AMD laptops, including this framework laptop that I bought with my own money. I was doing 4k 120 with the old looking glass just fine, but it, but uh, it was really intensive on the old CPU. Yeah. Uh, it's not anymore, which is amazing. Anti-cheat stopped me from doing VFI. Well, you'll be happy to know. Um, so this is another thing where, this is a good thing to put on a live stream, but not, not a video. Most of the time, the anti-cheat stuff doesn't work if you get really good with hiding the fact that it's virtualized. Mostly. Um, the other thing is a, a Valve thanks to Lord Gaben kind of leans hard on the publishers not to do that. And so if you're experiencing that, you should make a lot of noise if it's a steam game. Um, Hell Divers was the first game that I experienced problems on my 5,000 series Threadripper. And I don't know if it was anti-cheat or, or what it was, but I had problems running it in a VM and it's, but it runs natively. So you can just, you don't need to run it in a VM. I was just in my default mode of like, Oh, I've already got all this contraption set up to deal with this. I'll just, and then that didn't, that didn't work super good, but natively it actually does work better. Um, so yeah, and honestly, I can't believe how good, like Lord Gaben was right. I would have thought for sure that the path to salvation here was running virtual machines in uh, for gaming and like passing through a GPU or splitting up functions of a GPU, like taking your 16 gig GPU and splitting it into two eight gig GPUs and running windows in a nice little sandbox. There's a lot of advantages from running windows in a sandbox. That's not going away. But the fact that Proton and like those people and like a glorious egg roll and those those folks have sunk, sunk so much time into getting it working correctly that it's incredible. It really Linux is is nine tenths of the way toward a first class gaming experience. Thanks almost entirely to Valve. You know, it's like you're on the wrong side of an angry billionaire and he's going to upset the entire apple cart around your virtual machine for, uh, you know, gaming and everything else. That is mind blowing. But also, I would like to be friends with those billionaires because I've got some ideas for things that are disruptive in the same way that probably wouldn't cost as much. And uh, yeah, that, uh, that'd that be a lot of fun. So, Yeah. What's, this is the framework 16, so this is pretty massive. I'm worried new anti-cheats will block Proton since on Windows they embed themselves directly into the kernel, which obviously Proton doesn't let, let them do on Linux. This is a game publisher problem. Okay, so here's a here's a here's an engagement challenge for you, chat. Let me frame the think how I want to frame this. Suppose that you're a programmer and you're working on a game and the game is really enjoyable, um, but you want to not uh, let people cheat easily. And the people that cheat are astonishingly good at cheating. Suppose that there existed a facility in the computer so that you, the programmer, could um, assure that the computer that you wrote is uh, the, the program that you wrote is running the way that you intended. So suppose that the computer, like suppose this framework laptop had a thing in it to where when I run my program, if there's tampering with my program, the program would be made aware that it, it has been tampered with. It's memory space has been tampered with. 
you know, something like that. Think about like secure encrypted virtualization that AMD has. If you've got a virtual machine running and that virtual machine is trying to tamper with another virtual machine and they're isolated with secure encrypted virtualization, the machine that has been tampered with will know that it has been tampered with. And so should the control of that be in the programmer's hand or in the person who runs the computer's hand? because that's where we're going in the next five years. There is hardware facilities that are being built into the system. Uh, we had a bit of a false start with uh, locking the system down so that the user doesn't have access. Most of those things are largely dead. So you look at something like Pluton, okay, that's like the worst example because Microsoft has control of your system and you don't. But what if we turn it around a little bit and it is you, the programmer, have an ability to know if someone is tampering with your program. It's not that you take away the user's ability to tamper with your program, although effectively you have taken away the user's ability to tamper with your program, but it doesn't take away the ability for you to do whatever you like with your computer. So like in the case of the Linux kernel, like if I want to run a custom Linux kernel and I'm, I'm changing the argument here just a little bit, but go with me for a second. So I'm going to run a custom Linux kernel on my computer. I compile it and I sign it. And this kernel that has customizations, some of it I've used like the canonical kernel and some of it I've got my own module. And this ball of state is managed by my own personal cryptographic keys, but the composite is made up some of stuff from canonical, which I can trust because of canonical's encryption keys. And some of it is my own stuff, which theoretically, if I've, you know, dotted my I's and crossed my T's, is stuff that is reasonably secure. And so I've put this amalgamation together and I've signed it digitally. And then so if somebody comes along and evil maids my laptop or tries to replace a kernel or whatever, it's going to break those cryptographic keys. And so I know as the user that something has changed. But if I'm a programmer and I offer my users programs, or if I'm a programmer and I offer my users games, and I can be assured that the um, computer uh, is executing the game as I intended, and its memory space is encrypted, so that you're not poking around memory to find out where in memory uh, the number of lives is stored, and so on and so forth. Uh, does there, and there exists a hardware enforcement facility on the CPU and on the platform to handle securely those aspects of, of computation. Is it, is, is that necessarily a bad thing? Is it, is it a bad thing that a user has that? Like, do we, I, because my opinion is that I don't think that that's a bad thing. I, like a Pluton is a bad thing, I think. Very bad. It's astonishingly bad. Black box. It's got all the hall. It's got all the red flags of astonishingly bad things happening. But if we build a platform where I, the user, can decide, it's okay. The I want to run this program. I want to run this program as the programmer intended, and be assured that the program is running as the programmer intended. I'm cool with that. This actually ends up breaking a lot of things though. Um, <clears throat> so it turns out that like, if you look at games specifically, NVIDIA will do binary patching of a game. So like as the game is running, the video drivers, drivers will patch how the game works in memory. And so I've, I've set up this very elaborate thing to talk about a thing that would be impossible to do in the current day. But then you think I'm talking about Pluton or or secure encrypted virtualization or Microsoft's trusted or Microsoft or uh, Intel's trusted platform stuff. And that's part of it. But there's also like on the driver side with games and things like that, like game programmers don't go back and revisit games. And so there's a new version of the game driver. And then it's like, Oh crap. When we play Starfield with XESS on the new Intel arc drivers and you bring up the menu and close it at the wrong time, it only runs at like half FPS. This is a bug in Starfield. And okay. But Intel can look at the game and look at how it's running and use the debugger. And the wizards there can patch how the game runs to make it more efficient. The game is no longer executing as the programmer intended. There is some black magic happening there. And you, the user, are not really aware of those things that are going on. I'm a little bit more aware of those things because of the shenanigans that I have to deal with on the Linux side. But by and large, nobody's really aware of that except the, for the, the folks that are doing those kinds of things. And so I that seems like not a good thing, especially in the wake of like the Linux XZ backdoor and, you know, so I think that as a programmer, it's a good thing that my 
program can execute and I'm reasonably sure that it's executing the way that I intended. And as an end user, I think being able to say, I'm going to allow this program to run in this sandbox and it is executing the way that I intended is a good thing, even though I don't necessarily have transparency into what the program is doing. Um, at least as much, I mean, I don't really, cause I don't have the source code to a lot of games. I don't really have that much inside anyway, but I would have even less inside if memory space and everything else is encrypted. So, eh. so chat, what do you think? I think that's a bad thing because I learned how to program by hacking save games. Yeah, that's I learned a lot from doing that as well. But see, it's really up to the game developer. I think if you have a game developer that allows, you know, that allows cheating or has cheat codes or does whatever, it's just like, hey, the, the integrity of this game file is not what, you know, it doesn't match. Are you okay with that? And it's like, yes. And it's like, okay, is this a competitive match? Are you going to play online? And the answer is no. So we would avoid things like, oh, this person cheated in order to do this. And it's like, mm, yeah, that makes sense. No guests on the stream. It's just me. This is the first time I'm trying to. So part of the, the other metagame here, if you're just joining us, is I would like to do more content for the Linux channel in a way that is is easier Um to produce because it's definitely like the fringe, like this is like chill, low key stuff. So I'm kind of curious to see how this does. So we're just sort of chatting about things and uh, talking. We talked a little bit about um, uh, Looking Glass, which you should definitely check out Looking Glass because the PCIe P like 4K 120 FPS with relatively low CPU overhead is an enormous breakthrough for Looking Glass 7 RC1 and you should check that out. And also give Jeff a lot of money because that would be good so that he can like do more stuff. Does this apply to games that have been opened up like what's on what's on good old games? Well, I mean, it could theoretically. So like good old games is able to wrap the, the game and say this game is running the way that we intended. Um, that would make it harder for malware too. So like if someone is, you know, setting up a, a pirated game, um, it's a little easier to say, hey, this is running as we intended. There is actually a mechanism right now for signing executables. It's just too easy to re-sign a modified executable with somebody else's stuff to say, hey, this is legit. And it's like, wait a minute, this pirated EXE is not signed by Ubisoft anymore. It's signed by uh, Bob's Calculator Inc. And it's like people don't look for that or notice that. And so you can, it's just because it's signed doesn't mean you're not going to get malware. There's dozens of us. Well, but also, you know, what's interesting because, um, you know, like I say, I've been running my system and it's been stable and it's like, okay, what, what has got me excited in the world of Linux? Uh, I've almost, I mean, I'm, I'm super excited for the cosmic desktop. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And I want to do some videos on that when it comes out. And so like, you know, system 76 and Jeremy solar are, uh, doing some amazing stuff. I'm sure on, on cosmic, I've been sort of keeping up from all of the teasing that goes on with that. Uh, Vinny 2142. Thank you for the 10 bucks. Love me. Linux. Keep up the great work. Oh, he's trying. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I don't know. One of the things that I think is going to be exciting with AI in the year of the Linux desktop is that AI is probably going to enable, folks that are more ordinary to make meaningful contributions to open source without having to learn all of the, uh, uh, all of the secret handshakes and, uh, ritual dances in order to get something submitted. So like, I give you a great example. Look at GNOME, you know, you know, I'm not, not picking on GNOME in GNOME. Like, okay, I've got this, I was testing this framework laptop, which is just lovely. By the way, I'm going to go to search and I'm going to type screensaver and it brings up settings and three more things. And I'm going to hit the thing on that. And I've got a drop down menu for my screensaver and it goes in one minute increments to 15 minutes and then never. 
And yes, I know I can just change the settings directly in the preferences file from the terminal. That's not the point. Can I, we are, we are right now today at the point where if a user goes through the right secret handshakes and magic dances, they could just ask a large language model, where in the code is that? What do I need to do to submit a pull request to make something less dumb? And they would get a meaningful and mostly correct answer for how to do that. We just need to put some, some guides and how to's together to do that. And then all of a sudden the fidelity and positive aspects of user experience with using Linux as a desktop operating system for relatively normal people are um, suddenly way better because there's enough people that are submitting a pull request as opposed to just asking why is that and why is that so dumb versus, you know, just doing it in code. So you, you ask the same question, but in code, it's like, I would like to, you know, do this, but then let's do this other thing. Uh, the other thing is that Wayland and some of the other stuff, uh, some of the little plumbing things are um, finally uh, coming together, making a positive. Mm, it's no one wants to work in the basement that smells funny. And <laughs> working in some of these environments is like working in the basement that smells funny. And there are people that are perfectly willing to do that. And I get it. And they're, they're really taking one for the team to do that. But the weird smelly parts of Linux are for the most part going away at an accelerating pace. And I think that AI is only going to accelerate that further to the point that people that haven't learned all of the secret handshakes and all of the, the, the ritual dances uh, will be able to make meaningful contributions to open source in general. And it's going to be amazing. And, uh, you know, KDE was, uh, had some updates recently that were a little rocky as well, but they've really quickly been able to resolve a lot of those things. And, um, I also think that's really encouraging for the future of like a normal person, Linux desktop experience. But for me, Linux as a reasonable desktop experience has been fine for a couple of years now. And, uh, I really like it. Is Proxmox the future now that VMware is out of the question? See, that's the thing. You know, that's a that's a that's a hilarious talking point. VMware is not out of the question. VMware is still miles ahead of pretty much every other competitor at the farthest end of where you can be. It's it's almost like the, the GPUs in the data center thing, like AI and GPUs in the data center. Like when Jensen was talking about GTC, he wasn't talking about GPUs, he was talking about being like NVIDIA being the turnkey consultants for entire new vertical industries they've never worked in before. And that's kind of, um, that's kind of like what we're talking about when we're talking about VMware. VMware is as far ahead of everybody, um, as NVIDIA is with their thinking when they're thinking, you know, beyond the GPU, they're thinking about entire industries. Like this industry would benefit from, AI automation, machine learning, whatever. And so there really isn't a competitor for NVIDIA. I mean, there really isn't a competitor for VMware in some of those spaces. The problem is that it's the, it's OS two versus windows 3.1 again. Like this is not the first time. I think that was probably the first time historically something like that happened. Like IBM had their OS two, which was not a toy operating system for desktop computers. You could do you know, sec secure, reliable, well-engineered things with OS two and Microsoft had their dinky little, you know, DOS and windows, which is not, not even made for the computer to be on more than 30 days at a time, which is just poor architecture and poor planning. And, um, windows won out because it was easier, simpler, cheaper by a lot. And for those reasons, I think Proxmox will eventually win, um, but there isn't in, in the way that OS two running on the things that OS two running on windows and DOS was just not an alternative. It's kind of like that for Proxmox right now. If the things that really need the advanced features of VMware, you kind of stuck. Um, but Proxmox solves the problem for a lot of people, a lot more than they're willing to admit. And so I think, um, uh, I think that there's, uh, you know, 
there's <laughs> there's some rockiness in the future for VMware. Nutanix or Nutanix, Nutanix is it Nutanix or Nutanix is more user friendly than Proxmox. Yes, hundred percent agree with that. Nutanix is a great middle of the road alternative that is ahead of Proxmox and commercial and uh, has a lot of things. How is VMware ahead? Um, scale. It makes administrators' jobs a lot of easier with scale. VDI, uh, data management, being able to mix storage policies. I need 50 replicas of this. I need two replicas of that. You can get all of those things if you really know what you're doing as, a, as an experienced administrator. But if you're an idiot, it's a lot easier to get it right with VMware than it is with anything else. There's a lot of reasons. <laughs> Live! Looks like you got sucked into an abstract version of the Firefox logo. That was, yeah, that's what it is. It's uh, it's just like, yeah. this is just a chill chat. Like, we're just hanging out. We were talking about um, Looking Glass. Looking Glass is uh, hardware accelerated now. And uh, PCIe, PCIe transfers. So cutting out one memory transfer means that like 4K 120 FPS is entirely reasonable. Nutonix. Nutonix. Interesting. Nutonix runs on whatever you want. My favorite thing about Nutonix is that they actually give you almost all of the stuff that you need to just uh, barcode scan in the MAC address of the server, network boot, and then it's part of the fleet. Like, that's how it should be. Servers are cattle, not pets. I'm just going to boot the infrastructure and uh, uh, you're good to go. If you want to use an expensive product with a nice GUI, no iSCSI, no NFS, you have to use the storage. What was that? What was that in regard to? I lost the I lost the plot. Gosh, the scrolling is so nice on this touchpad and the framework. I settle for AI and <laughs> like the dependencies for me on the fly. <laughs> oh Lord. I just I'm thinking of like NPM, but with <laughs> that sounds like oppression to me. <laughs> <laughs> How long between HDR until HDR parity between Linux and Windows? Yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, soon, I hope. I'm really surprised. The whole HDMI consortium, I'm really like, we need to make more noise about that because the HDMI consortium needs to understand that. Do you know what Intel does on their GPUs? I mentioned it in my videos. Intel's. The ARC A770, it's all DisplayPort out, but that one physical HDMI port is a soldered on DisplayPort to HDMI adapter. And I don't know if Intel did that because of the HDMI forum shenanigans, but if they did, it's brilliant because that HDMI output is gonna work perfectly on Linux with the exception of variable refresh rate, which is different than DisplayPort variable refresh rate. So that's gonna be a problem always anyway. My job is probably going to go to Nutanix because of the VMware prices. It's insane. Yeah, I, yeah, VMware, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, I know, yeah, it has not been good for me. How is the Linux experience on the framework? Absolutely delightful. HDMI can stay in the living room on the TV. Yeah, but what if you're rocking an OLED TV because you don't want to pay three thousand dollars for an OLED computer monitor? You gotta then you gotta wrestle with HDMI or you gotta start modifying your TV. How good is Arc on Linux? It's a little bit of a mixed bag. When it's good, if it's if you're it can be really good, but there are landmines you can trip over where you're gonna lose a limb. <laughs> Call it HDM art. <laughs> and hopefully, I finally dump silly old Fedora for way less convenient Nix OS. I, I do like Nix OS. Um, I, uh, Red Hat, man. Red Hat. I'm sure that, uh, uh, uh I'm sure that Jeff Geerling can tell us about Red Hat. Like, that wouldn't actually be terrible. Did you sort out the system 76 power management stuff on Pop OS on the framework or end up going with something else? So right now this is, uh, I'm still, I've got a follow up video that I'm working on, on the, on this framework. And so right now it's back on Ubuntu. Um, but 
I did some more fiddling with Pop! OS and how they approach power management. And right now, Pop! OS is very slightly ahead of the framework sanctioned how-to on power management on, uh, on this configuration. And I think part of it is because this has the DGPU module. If I didn't have the DGPU module in this, I think it would be much different power. I didn't order the blank for this. So I don't want to run it without the DGPU module in because I'm like carrying this around and using it. And um, I think the battery life would be dramatically way better without the DGPU module, even though I don't use it when I'm not plugged into something. And so I think part of the reason why Pop! OS power management is better has something to do with the fact that this has a separate discrete GPU and it's in a deeper sleep somehow than the walkthrough that Framework has um, for uh, Ubuntu. But I don't know that to be sure. That's just a guess. <sighs> Eating nuts. Now these are, these are blue diamond uh, Mexican style street corn. It tastes like you're eating a, but it's the almonds. <laughs> Fedora OS is great. It is actually not bad. Uh, do you still see Linux Plus being relevant? If not, what do you recommend? It depends on, like, look at the job. Like, if you're looking for jobs and the job listings say, we're looking for Linux plus then do it. But you know, if it depends on how you job interview and what they're looking for and how you answer the questions, street corn. Yeah. I don't know. Somebody said something about nuts in the chat. I don't know. Uh, let's see. What was the other thing? Uh, let's see if I can switch scenes here. Um, is it this one? Yeah. So there's looking glass beta seven release candidate. There's so much cool stuff going on with this. You definitely check that out. And then the other thing was uh, the SRIOV, like Flex 170. Did everybody check out this video? Because this was awesome. Finally, SRIOV. And I know what you're thinking. What, what about the A770? So let's you in on a secret. Well, okay, two secrets. Um, one, uh, you probably won't need to do cross flashing with the right combination of software to get at least a couple of SRIOV virtual functions. Probably. Um, the state of the Git repository has changed pretty dramatically since the end of last year. And most of the software that you need to do that is already there. Um, if you do cross flash an A770 into a Flex 170, um, I don't know that it hundred percent works correctly unless you have like a launch day, a 770, which seems to be the same PCB as a flex 170, but there's something ECC related. There's something related to like error correcting memory and ECC and things are really weird with that. They don't ship the, the, the driver, the windows driver actually does a firmware update on the card. Um, but the a 770. Uh, but it's not the firmware update that it does is not a full copy of everything that's on the chip. But, and here's the mind blowing thing this minis forum, the iGPU on this, it does do SRIOV, which is also accidental. It's not supported, it's not officially supposed to do that. I mean, okay, back in the day, Intel did actually officially support GVTG, which is a competing. GPU compartmentalization technology, but that's deprecated. That's going away. That's not a thing anymore. And so you can do SRIOV. So this configuration is the i9-13900H. There's a link below if you want to check it out on Mini's forum. I definitely recommend that you do that. Uh, this is the one terabyte US configuration. This one, it ships with Windows, but I've got you know 32 gigs of DDR5 memory in here. This thing has a PCIe slot and built-in SFP plus 10 gig, which I have tested with the SFP plus to copper adapters, which use more power. And so they run hotter, uh, but it works fine. So look at this. This is a 13900H with a half height, half length, 25 watt PCIe slot. There's a video on this already up on Patreon. And so like you could throw in a an MSI, MSI, you could th throw in an LSI, a RAID controller in here 
and then use this as a front end for like, you know, a petabyte of NetApp disk shelf stuff. If you follow this channel, you know that we've done a ton of videos on the NetApp disk shelf stuff. And so this as a monstrously fast dual 10 gig built in platform for being the front end of your storage server. Also with built in dual 40 gig Thunderbolt is pretty mind blowing. I think, I think Linus is working on a video with a bunch of these, uh, probably, maybe possibly. Um, and you can use like the video that we did on using Thunderbolt as a 10 to 20 gigabit interface for a cluster. And then you've got your built in 10 gig interface here for that. And then you've got everything else. Uh, this is a great like training platform, home lab platform. It's actually a little expensive, I think for a home lab platform, because you could just use e-waste and accomplish the same thing for your home lab. But it is so powerful because it's a modern, like you're, these are modern, I mean, it's 1300H. It's modern Alder Lake style P cores. It performs really well for pretty much everything in that 100 watt power envelope and user expandable RAM. So if you wanted to use the Thunderbolt ports for DisplayPort out, you can do that. So you could do HDMI plus two DisplayPort. And then it's also got dual built in two and a half gig. So virtual machines, forbidden router type use cases, if your internet connection is two and a half gigabit or slower, you still got both of your 10 gig connections. If your internet connection is 10 gigabit or faster, and you can manage your internet connection coming in on the SFP plus connection, then this, this little thing is just, it gets it done. And you know, in that hundred and some watt power envelope, assuming that your your add in card doesn't use all the all the power, uh, there's actually a thread on the forum for all the devices that I tried in it for compatibility. So if you're new if you're new to the Minis Forum game, Minis Forum's uh, BIOS doesn't always tolerate a lot of stuff. So like you got the ITX boards. It's like I'm going to run the e Intel E810 in the ITX boards. I didn't think to test that. And it turns out that sometimes the UEFI modules for that, or sometimes some of the uh, PCIe stuff for that um, is problematic. And so the, it won't post, it won't boot. And it's a similar, you'll run into a couple of things like that on the MSO one, but generally the MSO one is dramatically way better, but there are odd things. So like it has a U.2 slot. There's actually an M.2 to U.2 adapter that's bundled, but you're going to have to use a, seven millimeter, he's seven, maybe a nine millimeter U.2. It will not do a 15 millimeter U.2. So like somebody in the chat mentioned the 60 terabyte Solidon physically won't fit in here. Neither will like the, the, the cheap Keoxia CD fives or the Intel 4,500. It physically will not fit in here. So you, you're definitely going to want to check out the review video, um, that I did, which I think will be live in, in a few days. If it's not already, it's already on Patreon and float plane. Um, and then similarly, the PCIe slot. So like the PCIe slot, half out, half length. So check this out. Uh, this is the NVIDIA RTX 4000 SFF ADA generation. <laughs> the bad thing about this card, $1,400, $1,500. I think this is the PNY version, but there's 20 gigs of VRAM on this card. And so if you want to run a large language model in Linux, and have it only use 70 watts, there's no external power connector. Like you wanna enable Home Assistant to run all the time with a large language model, that's the card. It's $1,400 and it's like, oh, should I get a 4090 instead? Yes, if you physically have room for a 4090 and you don't mind the fact that the 4090 is gonna be 350, 400 watts, then yeah, you, you should just get a 4090 over that. But other than that, if you want something in a 70 watt power envelope or something that, that actually would work in the MS-01 if it physically fit, if you want to run it with a 3D printed, like it physically does work in here without the top on it or with a PCIe extension cable. But uh, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, so uh, that's a lot of fun. If you're just doing home lab stuff though, cast off old um, enterprise gear or old like SFF desktop PCs are really the way to go. Um, Serve the Home has some incredible content on those HP small form factor ones that have their own proprietary 10 gig modules where you can get a copper 10 gig module or you can get an SFP plus um, 10 gig module or whatever like that. Um, but uh, it, uh, it works really well. When you're partitioning the graphics resources with SRIOV, do you have to reboot the system? 
With the Flex 170, no. If all of the machines are off and all the resources are free, you can move from three to seven to 21 virtual functions. Um, but if any of the virtual functions are in use, then you would have to reboot to free it. The Because the iGPU use case is, um, let's call it a little bit more uh, by the seat of your pants, you should reboot, but it doesn't necessarily have to reboot. So, just depends. You may be making a video about SRIOV on the A770. Not specifically on the A770, at least not until the... Uh, if you look at the GitHub source tree and the out of tree stuff that I linked in the how to on the forum, it needs to be a little farther along and then, yeah, maybe I will do a special piece of content for it then. But I've already given you everything that you need in order to put something like that together. And it's not officially sanctioned. Like if you just want to get your toes wet and how this is going to work, the MSO one, people have already done the how to for that. And I think the only reason there's not a similar how to for the A770 is because it's just not as widespread. So should be good. <laughs> Where's my 10 gigabit key KM switch? Oh, thank you, Nori SS. I appreciate it. <laughs> When's Gigabyte bringing you back to Miami so you can ride the speedboats? I don't know. Soon-ish. I don't. Uh, I don't know. Miami was a lot of fun. It was. Uh, it was good weather in Miami. It was not a uh, suffering, uh, relentless heat. It was like California heat, which is quite nice. So that was fun. So how am I doing on my, uh, oh my gosh, that root beer is incredible. <laughs> do you have thoughts on the XZ exploit? Uh, what do you want to know? So I'm glad that it was caught and I'm surprised, like, because OpenSSH doesn't really have, like, it's kind of wild that in order for OpenSSH to be exploited by this, it depends on out-of-tree patches to SSH to tie it into system D. And it's just like, pottering! <laughs> you know, uh, a little bit. It's sort of funny. I don't, I don't know. So, um... <laughs> I think Arch already has the an SSH that's just like, no, we're going to strip all of that out. Like, why was this like this in, to begin with? No, we don't need that. Um, which is kind of funny. But uh, I think because of that and because of the way that it was caught, we're going to get a lot of these things audited pretty quickly by people that know what they're doing. And I think it'll be there's probably already responsible disclosures happening to get some things fixed that, uh, there's probably a few more things lurking there than, than we really realize. Um, but at the same time, I think some of the proprietary, uh, operating systems have similar stuff because like, if this wasn't open source and you did have somebody like, it's easy for me to, well, okay. So I know somebody inside Microsoft and we've literally had this conversation before the XZ exploit, and, you know, a customer calls up and is like, hey, I'm running this little tiny micro benchmark and this thing that used to take 100 milliseconds is now taking 750 milliseconds and what gives? And from Microsoft's side, it was literally like, oh, we'll look into that when we get to it. And internally, that's usually treated as this is a crazy customer uh, that is just, but okay, you know, may, if their support contract is large enough, we'll take a look at it. Whereas because this is open source, there's more tools that if you are insane enough, you can dig to it, dig down to it and find and find out what's going on. I think also the tooling around AI is going to change this because if you had somebody that uh, you had somebody like me, I'm not familiar enough with the internals of like open SSH to be productive. But if I had a large language model where I could say, Hey, you know, step me through this code or, or a large language model meets an interactive debugger. Like what sort of crazy Lovecrafty and abomination is that going to be? But if you could just talk to your debugger and it's just like, Hey debugger, walk me through this, help me understand. 
you're probably going to be able to find stuff lurking in the otherwise opaque binary code that you wouldn't be able to find. And so that is a, a possible major breakthrough in our tooling and something to be incredibly optimistic about because most of the, like most of the time when software gets way dramatically better, it's not because of a new programming language or a new thing. It's because there's a whole new paradigm about being able to look at the code and debug it and see the state of the system on a dashboard. Like, like when, when finite state machines were conceived of, it was like, Oh yeah, of course, of course, this is how we should think about managing the state inside a machine. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is, you know, it makes perfect sense. And we're not quite there yet with large language models because there's still a little bit, you know, there's, there's, there's still a little bit of the, the, you know, the parrot that's obsessed with itself in the mirror aspect of large language models. But I think that it's, there's going to be that kind of a breakthrough where you can just talk to your debugger and your debugger is going to walk you through it without you having to be read in on all the secret handshakes and special dances. Does that, is that, does that answer what you were asking? The XC exploit was a partially committed binary. It was a partially committed binary that was part of the tests, yeah, but the fact that it could be the code was reachable from SSH because SSH was patched to be able to log to system D, which supported compression, like an SSH normally isn't like that is interesting. And does suggest that perhaps things do merit a more close investigation. A lot of people are upset about the auto tools aspect of it. I think that's a, a bit of a red herring. Like auto tools is cruft, yes. And, you know, here there be dragons and cruft, but there's cruft everywhere. I mean... Uh, let's see what else was on my to-do list. We've got we got the MSO one, which I got to tear down in the video. We've got the Flex one seventy, and we got Jeff's Looking Glass stuff, which is like the state of the art in Linux. We talked a little bit about XZ. Is there anything else we need to ch chat about? Chat before I go. <laughs> when is Wayland done? When we've got a large language model large enough to. Um, treat the, to load like all of the Wayland code base, the, how many tokens would that have to be to just load the entire code base into the LLM <laughs> tech debt? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Peter Higgs died. The Higgs boson. <laughs> that solid on 64 terabyte drive, you know, they're not making like 60 terabyte drives that they're just selling old stock. So like, I don't know. Thank you. Another online alias when, uh, when is Moore's law truly dead? Gates don't shrink. What's next? Accelerators, new substrates, probably new substrates, new technologies. Do I like Ubuntu? It gets the job done. Like is perhaps too strong a word. Gemini has about a 1 million context size. That's pretty good. I really like PreSonus and others are making drivers for Linux. It really is surprising how neglected um, deferred procedure call latency stuff is in Windows 11 and how shockingly bad it continues to be after every Windows 11 update. Like the ancient legacy last version of Windows 10 Enterprise that Microsoft is obsessed to death with you not running and paying money on a, on a yearly basis to keep up is so much better than the state that we're in 
with the most recent version of Windows 11, I just don't think that I don't think there's enough people inside Microsoft to be able to keep up with the engineering. It's the only conclusion that I can come to because there's a lot of USB drivers that are just bad, just very, very bad. And I really looking last seven, I feel like I'm just, I'm still daily driving five. Yeah. That's that we were talking about that at the beginning of the chat. It's like, I'm still on a, uh, a, uh, 5,000 series Threadripper, And it's like, I've got my stuff set up. I can play my games and my, the state that they're in a virtual machine is reasonably well hidden from the games that I like to play. And they don't complain about it, even though I know that they would, if they could tell, I don't want to touch it. It's good. And to that extent, I've got a whole new 7,000 series Threadripper system set up and good to go. But I've had such struggles because there's only the one WRX 90 motherboard right now. That's just like, ah, it's like, it's driving. I'm just sitting here rocking back and forth in the chair, trying to, uh, trying to upgrade. Cause I got all this cool hardware. It's just like, ah. There's going to be videos on that. Don't worry. I'm really excited about looking glass. Like all this stuff coming together at the same time is great. Cause a lot of cores, a lot of Ram, a lot of GPU horsepower, looking glass. And the fact that proton and all of the stuff with native Linux gaming is as good as it is. It's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to go with two identical GPUs for my system then. Cause I could play in either scenario. Are you moving clients off VMware to what solution most often? Yes. A mix of Hyper-V and Proxmox right now. XCP and G may be for special cases. Man, VMware just... Unless you were a billion dollar client, they do not care. Which is wild because like, we didn't cost them any money. It was just free money. Still enjoying the framework? Yes. This is a nice... 16 inch laptop that is not unwieldy. My 4790K motherboard died. That's too bad. You might be able to hit me up on the forum. I might have a spare motherboard I can send you in the basement. I literally just retired a uh, 4790K like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I I mean, it's just it's what we have around the office here. It's just like, okay, I got to do that. All the best from the West Coast. Thank you, Gabriel Rodriguez. I appreciate it. But uh, yeah, all right, last call for questions and I'm going to get out of here because we've been going, what, about an hour, give or take? I don't know. I want to do more of these kind of streams that are not like super long, but are on topics. And so like if there's something you want to discuss on the Level 1 Linux channel, make a thread for it on the Level 1 forums because I'd like to do these a lot more frequently as an easy way to do content for this channel. But uh uh, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out. I want to do, I want to do content. That's not a crazy amount of editing overhead. It's okay. If it's a lot of work for me, it's just not a lot of editing overhead. Sorry for the crunching. I'm not going to. Uh, thank you, Joseph Norris. <laughs> build your first server. Yes. Building your first server is a, is a thing. Okay. Chat. I can ask you about, I, I can ask you about that. I'm working on a video right now. You know, the crazy alien Asus wireless router. Okay. So I got, I got one of those Wi-Fi seven and it got me thinking like, I've really love in the past. Like I learned a lot working on like Linksys and OpenWRT and putting together a custom router. And that's kind of what has led, you know, years and years later to like the forbidden router and doing all and that is a great learning experience and kind of sort of with the, uh, Wi-Fi seven thing from Asus, the fancy gaming one is a little bit customizable and has a little bit, you know, modular componentry to it. And it's 10 gig and that kind of thing. And so I'm going to do a video on that because it's actually really good as an access point. And it's pretty good as a router. And it's like $500. But, you know, a router you could build out of an old PC and it would be fine. But it would use more electricity and take up more space. And you could buy, like, you couldn't get as good of an access point for less than probably like $250. It's a pretty good access point. And so you, you don't really save any money, 
But I'm thinking about how to package that in a video. Cause it's like, if you really want to do some amazing things, you should like build, like if you want to do hobbyists and learn stuff, like you should build all this stuff like open WRT or PF sense or, or open sense or something like that. And then do your own access point and put it together. But like this Asus thing, this Asus gaming router is not a terrible, like it, it does a reasonable job routing. It does a reasonable job with firewall and VPN and some of the Asus features. And it's a really good access point as far as Wi-Fi 7 access points go because it's got a bunch of antennas and it has a bunch of radios that can be busy simultaneously. And so I don't like, what's an interesting way to present that video? Uh, you can just email me 789 just wendell at level one text.com and uh, I can maybe do a manual thing or look into why your email is not going through. I actually get a lot of logs on that, so it should be good. I'm trying to push some of my coworkers toward con container orchestration, but they're afraid to touch it. What's your opinion on configuration management software, i.e., Ansible Chef Puppet? You could start with Docker, like Docker Compose. Uh, Docker Compose and then like, look, it's a shell script that runs Docker Compose and that would let them lean, you know, sort of, uh, shamble towards, uh, Ansible or Chef or Puppet. But, um, I found that personally, like Docker Compose was the thing where it's like, look, it's like Docker, but now you're getting, you can configure your database server and varnish and, your web front ends, you can have a whole fleet of web front ends and you can use Docker swarm and then you don't have to worry about it as much. And you just, it's all defined in this text file, which is in the Git repo. How cool is that? And, um, and then it's like, oh yes, we should just do this because orchestration makes sense. Asking people to immediately jump to Ansible is perhaps a bridge too far. Although if Jeff Geerling still here, I'm sure he would say no. And you should get his book on Ansible because it's very good. My company went to OpenShift. Yeah, OpenShift. OpenShift. Uh, you know, uh, I have at least one contact that went to OpenShift in a big way from VMware. They were just getting their toes wet with um, Tanzu. And they had scripted their own automation through the VMware API. It was actually like kind of impressive. Probably could have productized some of the stuff they did. They just had their own internal smart people. And after about a two month experimental period, I would say they were like, oh yeah, OpenShift, OpenShift is fine. And so they're all, they're all OpenShift now. One thing they're doing that's coloring a little outside the lines is I think some of their dev OpenShift boxes are running Linux MD, uh, which from what I understand is frowned upon, <laughs> but uh, otherwise the performance is really good. Infrastructure is king. Yeah, it really is. Infrastructure is code. OpenWRT running on a basic Belkin router. Yep. Starting with Podman will allow for an easier transition to kube later because you can do Podman kube generate. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. <laughs> Compose is limiting. Yeah. Well, okay. But for, you know, a pedagogical reasons, maybe it's okay. Oh, I bet the, I bet the YouTube auto transcripts couldn't get that one. <laughs> How soon do you think it'll be that until Intel, Intel adds XESS support to Linux? I would, I'm surprised it's not here already. Um, soon, probably. OpenShift Vert has a nifty import wizard for stuff like moving off VMware. Yes, it does. Uh, I'm with Mirantis OpenStack and Container Engine. Not a great experience to say the least. Oh, that might be a good thread on the forum, really. Um, so that'd be good. Any news on open pleb? Steve and I are going to get together in a uh, Computex. Um, it's officially incorporated and I think some of the paperwork is set up for a nonprofit. There are a lot of people excited about it and I really need to spend more time on it. And I haven't cause uh, life stuff getting in the way. I've done as much content for this channel as I wanted because life stuff getting in the way, which is why I'm doing this live stream to just be like, Hey, I'm here. I'm alive and I want to do stuff. I just got to figure it out. Power PC systems. I do. I did uh, cover um, the Raptor stuff a while back, and that was really amazing. So I have two MSO ones struggling to get networking 
working around a product cluster, one of them keeps going unresponsive, might be RMA worthy. Check your, are you doing using SFP plus or Thunderbolt? If you're using SFP plus, double check the temperatures. You can, one thing you can do for yourself is add a thermal pad between the SFP plus connector and this metal case. There's one there already, but you can add another one. And that really does like this metal case, like this is metal all the way around. This is really good. Thank you, Chris Bradley. I appreciate it. All right, that is probably enough streaming for now. If there's any other final questions. But uh, yeah, if you have experiences like this, share them in the forum. I'm talking about your containerization, your migration from VMware. Oh, I'd love to hear about your migrations from VMware. That would be amazing. Flex 140 is available from Dell as a customer upgrade. How much is it though? Is it like $17 billion or is it a reasonable price? How well does Olama work on that? Framework now that they have AMD GPU support. So the DGPU on this support in Olama is still a little sketchy because you need more VMware or more VMware, more, more VRAM. Um, but the 16 gig PCIe, like literally a week ago, got Rockham support to where it was mostly working. But a 7900 GRE is like the least like official unofficial GPU. It's really weird. Like the support, like, uh, it's really the Rockham. It's, 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 it's a little odd. Should I run Colon with 70 billion on a 5950X 128 gig with a 3090 24 gig? Uh, 70 billion. It's not going to fit in 24 gigs of memory unless you do like, um, like four bit. SFP plus. Thanks for the tips of the thermal pad. Oh yeah. The thermal pad. Check it. Like you can just feel it with your fingers. Uh, there is a way to pull the, it, depending on what sort of software you have, you can get the telemetry off the SFP plus. I bet if your SFP plus is overheating, it'll cause all sorts of weird problems with, uh, Proxmox. So, um, yeah. Do you recommend any postgraduate career or professional path to further develop hardware knowledge and DIY? <sighs> I mean, depends on what program you have. Like if you're in, uh, when I was, I was visiting IBM in New York with, um, Dr. Cutrus and like, if that university was in your backyard, heck I'd be taking, you know, adjunct classes. If it gave me access to IBM's facility there, because th those guys know what they're doing. So, uh, it just depends, depends on what, what you got going on, what you have access to locally. You'd, you'd be surprised what cool stuff is going on locally, but it's not always, uh, it's not always apparent unless you really go digging. So good luck with that. But yeah, any other questions or anything I missed, hang out in the forum. And I want to try to do another one of these streams like in a couple of weeks. So if you have other topics or things you want me to cover, let me know. But be sure to check out Jeff's Looking Glass. Be sure to check out the MS01 link below. And be sure to check out Flex170. Uh, because the, the guide that I did for the Flex170 is the same guide for SRIOV on this, literally the minis forum is the same guide for the arc a 770 as well, pretty much. But, uh, and that you may not have to cross flash if we can dot the I's and cross the T's and some of the out, like just unofficial SRIOV support. Cause it's unofficial SRIOV support on this as well, but being able to run, you know, your containers. I don't know. It's really exciting. This is Linux.